You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everybody. It's David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy, and I want to welcome to you That Gratitude Guy podcast, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. And as a time to get there, to reach the podcast, as you say, or hear it, if you will, if it is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time at the Transformation Talk Radio Network, and it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and any other places you get your podcasts. And please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or by email at david at thatgratitudeguy.com as well. And let me just get on with the show now. And as you may can tell, the people that are watching, of course, many of you get it on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, but it also goes out on YouTube. My guest is in studio this morning. And my... <laughs> My oldest son, Kyle, is a guest for today, so let me tell you a little about my very special guest. Kyle Brook is a native and lover of the Northwest, born and raised in Seattle, graduating from the University of Washington, was a goal from a young age. From there, the sky has been the limit from providing structure to troubled youth as a counselor, supporting friends and family through their ups and downs, or applying his curiosity of what makes people tick to various leadership roles. Kyle currently applies his passion for breaking down barriers and providing opportunities for everyone in his scope of impact by leading a team of 150 plus in delivering experiences to a major tech company's employees, vendors, and guests. This allows him to constantly identify growth opportunities and make connections to improve the experience of his team and those they influence in their journey. In his personal life, Kyle is a relentlessly engaged father, I know that to be true, and a dedicated husband and hopefully a positive role model for his siblings and support to his elders. Kyle, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for that wonderful introduction. That was, that was a great way to start the day. Absolutely. And as I said, we're trying a little something different today, a little side by side in the studio, which is kind of fun. So let me start out with what I always ask my guests first and foremost, and I have a feeling your answer is going to be an interesting one. How did we meet? <laughs> well, this is actually one of your favorite stories. I don't know that it's something that I would ne necessarily draw upon as uh, something that I've got the deepest of uh, memory of other than what has been shared with me. Um, but we, we met when I was about two years old and just a young gipper uh, coming to the door when you were coming to uh, join my mother for a nice run around Green Lake uh, as we've all enjoyed many, many times. Um, but the, the highlight of that visit and that introduction was, I was of course, uh, you know, as I do many times uh, now, uh, wearing very few clothes and uh, happened to just be coming up to answer the door in just a diaper. Um, so I'm sure that that was a great first impression. Uh, came up and said, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> you have a good recall. That, that was pretty close. It's like, are you looking for my mom? Uh, yeah, we have a, a date to go walk around or run around Green. It was running back then, run around Green Lake. So yeah, that was how we met. And then uh, later got married to that young lady and uh, made Kyle part of my life and our life, which is something that's extremely exciting. So I always like to talk about sort of walking back a little bit and talking about the early years and that you were two when I met you and, and maybe not quite that early, but kind of maybe the grade school, junior high experience and how that was for you. And I know we'll get into some other things too with unfortunately losing my wife, your mother and some things of how you were able to be resilient and, and bounce back from that. But how about some of those early years? What were some of the things that you were kind of focused on back that way back then? Yeah, so that, that was actually really an interesting transitional time of my life even before mom passed because I was I started off my elementary school career um, in the Seattle public school system and about halfway through that when I was going into fourth grade 
uh, transitioned over to private school, which is a pretty significant change in surroundings. So as I was going through that, you know, starting off in Seattle Public School, um, met a lot of great friends, a lot of people that I actually still spend time with today and, and call some of my best friends. Um, it was interesting to see that the, the curriculum was just not really up to speed. And, and I found myself being uh, less challenged than you would expect and kind of just finishing my homework in class. And uh, I feel like it really set me back a little bit and I had to really find ways to challenge myself. So I, I did take on opportunities, uh, tutoring other kids in my classes where they were struggling. Um, you know, maybe they didn't have as much time to practice as I did, or it didn't come as naturally to them. Um, so I would take some time out of my day, you know, after I'd finished my, my work and, and spend time with them, make sure that they were comfortable with it. And I think that was really, you know, something that started off a long life of wanting to give back to, to others and, and bring people along on the journey, um, rather than just running, running ahead of people. I, I wanted to run alongside people and make sure that they were, they were traveling along with me. Yeah, that's really neat. And expand a little bit. Dana was very passionate about private school. I remember that thinking that she didn't have a lot of faith in the public school system and, and justifiably so in some cases, but talk a little bit about the difference that you found. I think it was Villa Academy, mm -hmm. but that you found there versus the, the public schools. Cause I, I imagine it was somewhat dramatic, even at a younger age for you, the difference. Definitely. Um, so the first story that I could tell about that, and, and it was very impactful because it was actually my first day attending Villa. Um, they had me sit in just to see what the class was like, um, get familiar with the other students. Uh, and it was kind of, it, it wasn't um, like I was starting the school year off, you know, at the normal beginning of the school year. I was kind of coming in midstream where a lot of these kids had been attending since kindergarten together. They had already built relationships. Um, they had also already been on that curriculum, which as I said before, was a little bit um, uh, beyond what I had been experiencing in the Seattle public schools. So I remember vividly coming in on that first day and it was a spelling bee essentially that we were doing in, just in the class of 15 to 20 kids. Um, and it was words that, you know, I hadn't really even encountered up to that point. Um, and just getting that feeling of, is this really going to work for me? And am I, mm -hmm. am I going to be able to keep up with what's going on here? Which um, history has, has told that I, I was able to keep up, get caught up, feel comfortable with it. And it ended up being a bit of a different speed, a bit of a better speed for my learning style. So it was just that, that initial introduction to it where it was so different from what I had experienced up to that point. It really got my brain churning of, wow, this is going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. This is, this is going to be tough. So it kind of kicked me into gear of feeling like I needed to focus and I'm like, I needed to bring a lot more, um, you know, intention to the work that I was getting and, and the activities that were being done there. Uh, there were a number of other differences that I, you know, I point out um, some of the curriculum, very, very interesting aspects, um, blended learning where you were actually doing things in addition to just, you know, learning about it from a textbook. So getting more outside of the classroom learning, uh, which I think blended learning is uh, even today for adult learners is some of the best way to be able to um, interact with a subject that you're trying to learn more about. You know, it's, it's one thing to read about it in a textbook, but actually going out, seeing, feeling, touching, um, you know, getting some familiarity with people who are experts in that field. Uh, it's night and day how well you can pick up information that way. Yeah, and I, and I would think too, back to the villa versus the public schools is, if I hear you correctly, is a little bit is that playing with that better tennis player. It just was, is a lot higher standard. And again, I know that Dana felt very strongly about that. And, and uh, I can see it really made a big difference. And then I guess really from villa, you, you uh, transferred on into Roosevelt, correct? That's correct. Yeah, and then talk a little bit about that transition because Roosevelt's a pretty high school here in Seattle, is pretty well known and pretty well respected. How was that? So that, that was an interesting transition because again, at that point, I'm going from private school back to public school. So it, it was, 
it was kind of a revisiting, I'd say, of, of my experience of what I had uh, felt in elementary school that, okay, I'm operating at a bit of a different capacity than what the curriculum looks like here. So finding ways to, again, challenge myself, spend time um, with others, and, and again, bringing others along in that journey. I also took more time to dedicate towards sports, athletics. Um, I joined the golf team from freshman year uh, and was one of, the, one of the only people to actually make the playing uh, team as a freshman. Uh, on the golf team and then also played you know rec league basketball continued to play baseball for local teams um, and so just I, I'd say spread out uh, my activities among athletics and my academic my academics nice and I know is I always think about the listeners to this program and anybody I'm always trying to explain to the, the listeners, or at least that I want my guests to give them tips and takeaways from things that have happened to them in the, um, in the thought that maybe there's people out there that have gone through a similar thing. So it was around that time when you were 14, when Dana passed away. And what, what would you say to that person that's gone through something like that with the benefit of, of a 20, 25 years hindsight that maybe would help somebody or at least how you cope with that very, very challenging episode. It was so tough for me and so tough for a lot of people and your brother, Connor, and you and me and, and so forth. But how would you maybe advise if you think back on that, maybe what you learned or and with again, with the benefit of hindsight? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would say, you know, it, it's going to change you no matter what. So just take your time to mourn, um, especially with the something so impactful of losing someone so so close to you. But one of the really important things that that came out of that for me was recognizing that, you know, I still had a lot of people around me that great support system, um, people that had been there my entire life, um, but, you know, never having gone through something uh, so traumatic and, and such a big deal that, that could really rock the foundation of everything that you do. Um, just a simple thing of getting out of bed in the morning became a different, uh, you know, you had to approach it differently. You had to think about it differently because I'll be honest. I mean, when mom passed, I laid in bed for three days and I wasn't, I wasn't going anywhere. You know, I was a 14 year old kid, um, going through what 14 year old kids do and you know with the younger brother who didn't really know what was happening necessarily but still recognized that something has changed um, you know you really had to be strong but also take the time to recognize this is going to change me this is going to change my life and and so just taking that time to recognize that and and understand that it's okay um, it's okay to feel a little bit lost and it's okay to feel like um you know today is not a great day you don't have to be on all the time and just relying on the people that you know care about you rather than digging yourself into a hole where you distance yourself from people because that's i think one of the things that people do that can really uh make it hard to come back from those kind of traumatic experiences so focus on the things that you still have rather than the things that you've lost. And I think that's an excellent point of where I, I always talk about the little tips and thoughts and uh, ways that people can pass on some knowledge that have gone through a similar um, pathway. And I think just writing some of these things down, take the time, it's okay to feel lost. I think that's very, very important. Uh, today is not a great day. Uh, don't dig yourself a hole, focus on the things that you have. And you mentioned too, a lot of the people around you, the family, very, very strong set of grandparents and um, older sister and your younger brother and myself and just different people that were there. And so anything else you can think of, Kai, that you would tell that person that uh, it does get better or anything else, again, looking for somebody that's gone down that road? Yeah, I would say that as, as hard as it was at the time, I'm still able to look back and even to this day, feel like if I have successes that um, I'm, I'm having in my daily life, you know, whether it's with my family, whether it's with my career, I can still look back and, and point to aspects of that interaction with that person that was extremely important to me and see how they contributed to me being able to be successful in the things that I do now. And that gives me, you know, a lot of joy being able to say, okay, you contributed to this, you helped me achieve this, even if you aren't here anymore, 
I still appreciate everything that you did um, to set things up for my life and make sure that, you know, I was on the right path um, and, and to bring all of these great people into my life and make sure that I was, I, I was well taken care of up to that point. And I talk a lot about as that gratitude guy, uh, gratitude and how having a gratitude mindset and attitude of gratitude what, what role, I know you were, of course, a lot younger. You were 14 when Dana passed away, but what role do you think that played either then or later on in your life in terms of just really recognizing the blessings that you do have even when you go through tough times? Yeah, I'm, I mean, going, going into when, when mom passed, I mean, I was at that stage of my life where you're a teenager, all you really care about is, you know, hanging out with your friends and, and doing whatever you do, you know, you've got school that's there and then, you know, you figure that's always going to be there, but you, it's that point in your life where a lot of people start to kind of distance themselves from their family and, and feel like the home life is kind of where they are not necessarily feeling in their natural habitat. So looking back, I think one of the things that I really draw from that is appreciating and spending the time with people while you have them um, and appreciating not just the people, but the experiences. So, you know, don't save it all for a rainy day, make sure that you're having those experiences along the way. And, and that's the way I would kind of draw it back to um, more of how I've approached my life since then. Um, you know, don't save that activity for five years from now you know, go, go and go on that vacation, do the thing that you want to do. Don't leave all the money in the bank, but make sure that you are saving for the future and being prepared for all the things that you want to set up for, you know, your children or uh, help to support your family in another way. I think that's really good too. And I was thinking it's always, it's all strange when I think, well, what would have happened if Dana hadn't passed away and, and you can't go back and undo things. You can't unring a bell. But I think it's interesting some of those things go on vacation, don't put things off. I think in a lot of ways, that's what was maybe some of the silver linings that came out of an otherwise very sad situation about just the fragility of life and how it's important to really kind of take things. And uh, I know I was going to even mention you brought up vacations. I know you've taken some great vacations. I think it's so smart. And I think you uh, at 37 is part of really know millennials, but maybe the generation before that, just there's so much about understanding, do things now and don't my generation, my, my parents' generation were, you know, go get a college education, work for 50 years, get a gold watch and go to a nursing home. But wait a minute, what about experiencing life? And it's not all about work and they're, to have that really blend. And you were in the banking business for a while. You were at Key Bank. And I always said, you tell me about customers that you would see. Um, and get and see their personal situations. I always think you shouldn't spend all your money. You shouldn't save all your money. You want to be somewhere in between. And I think that's maybe where people find success. So, so you went on to the UAW and then we're going to get to your career and your family here in a little bit and, and uh, to fill everybody in on that. Talk a little bit about the UAW. Yeah, so um, going to the University of Washington was, it, it was a great experience, but it was definitely something where I really felt like I was a lot more honed in on what I was doing there rather than um, kind of what my experience had been up to that point with education. Um, a lot of my education up to maybe about my second year of college, um, I didn't feel like there was necessarily a lot of ownership um, because there, it just wasn't catered to exactly what I wanted to do and what my passions were. They were things that I had to do, right? They, there's a set of core curriculum that you are required to complete. Whereas when I was at university, it's all me. The, I have carte blanche to decide where do I wanna go? How do I wanna apply it? What am I interested in? And how am I going to get you know, the credits to accomplish the degree, which is kind of the secondary to it, rather than just the knowledge that you're attaining through, throughout that process. So I think that was the big difference for me and really a turning point from an academic standpoint, um, because I got to really focus in on a lot of the things that I was passionate about. I've always really cared about people. I've cared about why people do the things that they do. I've cared about um, some of the different aspects of people's backgrounds or, or experiences that might lead them down a certain path. And how could I be you know, a catalyst for positive change for someone? And how could I be kind of that 
um, person that helps set them down a, a better path than the one that they might be going down. Maybe they're facing struggles. Maybe they've had a traumatic experience that they don't know how to dig themselves out of. Um, you know, that was that really led very clearly into some of the work that I did directly out of college um, with troubled youth and, and helping them set structure to their lives rather than just kind of going down destructive paths uh, based on what they had experienced up to that point. So um, I'd say that was the, the biggest part of my, my academic career there at the UW was um, really being able to take a lot more ownership of what my learning path was gonna be and feeling empowered to do that. Well, I made a note why people do the things they do. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, and it does serve me correctly, you got a psychology degree. And I asked you one day, what's the biggest thing you learned from your psychology degree? What did you say? People are unpredictable. People are unpredictable. One of my favorite answers of all time and stuff. So so you, you headed out uh, and on to your career with Key bank and later with zones and ultimately with Microsoft and talk a little bit about the career path because you've had some nice jobs and, and moved up nicely and things and maybe uh, again maybe some tips or thoughts for people that uh, aren't going to go work at the same company for 40 years. Yeah, so uh, I, I started my career off, you know, thinking I was going down the path of being um, a counselor, you know, going into being a psychiatrist uh, and going down more of the clinical path. But as I started down that journey. Um, I, I quickly realized that although I really like to help people, you know, provide guidance, provide structure, I, I tend to have a very strong um, emotional base and, and patience and, and strength to be able to provide that support. Uh, the way in which the, the initial role that I had in that industry uh, was just not conducive to me continuing down that path. It was a real high burnout kind of role, um, you know, working with kids that were age eight to 12 that had been, you know, mentally abused, sexually abused, physically abused, and again, trying to set structure for them and help them out of that circumstance and be able to, you know, build up a productive life for themselves. Um, the, I think that the, the setting was uh, one that was actually one that really I was passionate about. It was something that I wanted to do, and I felt great about the impact that I was having while I was there. But unfortunately, the the way that that company was run that I was part of, uh, it didn't it didn't really set the stage for long term success. Right? It, it there were twenty four hour shifts in very high stress environments because these are children that are essentially living in this place twenty four hours a day, you know, seven days a week, all year round. Um, and, and so it, it has the potential to really burn you out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having the, having the introspection that I gained over, you know, years of my life, understanding who I am, how I react to situations, I saw that this probably wasn't going to work out in the long run. So I thought about, you know, how can I still make an impact and, you know, drive people to success without risking my own mental health and feeling like, you know, not being able to put my own mask on first before I help somebody else with their mm -hmm. oxygen mask. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I left that industry and I ended up going into the financial industry, but with the strong understanding that my target was going into leadership and regardless of what I had to do or the path that I needed to take, that was where I was headed. So I started off as a part-time teller, um, working downtown in the Seattle Metropolitan Tower. I remember it very well, uh, working for some great leaders. Um, so already started my foundation really well there, uh, seeing the types of things that worked, seeing the types of things that didn't work and being able to you know, start to kind of mentally take those notes and see, okay, those are the types of things, those are the leaders that I wanna be like. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I want to adapt and that's how I want to impact people. So from there, you know, went into being a full-time teller, a lead teller, uh, went into operations and uh, operations management and compliance, um, where I was a, a direct supervisor and leader for um, a team of about five or six. Uh, that really set the stage for understanding, you know, how to, how to work with people, um, how to get the best out of them, and how to help them grow into what they were looking to be. Because you know, their entry level roles, it's not necessarily what they're looking to do over a long period of time. Um, 
but it gave me the opportunity to start to seek out like where can I get you some different experience and, and how can I get you exposed? Maybe if you were interested in going into sales or being a branch manager, you know, have you sit down with somebody who's already doing that and what got them to where they are? Mm -hmm. um, that, that was just, it, it set the stage really well for what I was going to do, what, what, what I would end up doing uh, over the next 10 years or so. Um, so from there, I, I went and decided that, you know, the financial industry is not exactly maybe what it once was. And, and I'm interested in dipping my toes in, in some different water. So I wanted to get a little bit more experience in the IT industry, but still be a leader and still have that same impact because you know, you'll see that's, that's going to be the theme for what I continue to do. Um, and I don't see myself ever stopping that because I continue to be very passionate about people and, and their success and, and making sure that they have all of the opportunities that they possibly can to go down the path that they want to go down. Um, so I spent time at a, at a small company uh, called Zones um, out in Auburn. And I, I knew right away that at least the leadership that I had when I got started there um, was passionate the same way that I was about, you know, enabling their people to be successful. Uh, I actually went into my job interview there on crutches after having shattered my ankles celebrating a, a Seahawks NFC championship victory. Uh, and they, they were very uh, empathetic to me and very appreciative that I would make that journey on crutches. And it, it just happened to be, of course, uh, you know, the dead of winter at that point. So the ground was slippery, all that, all that sort of thing made my way out there. And, and I think that, you know, that, um, that, that impressed them that I was willing to be that to persevere for, through some of those challenges and still be there in person. And, uh, that started a career of about five and a half years with them. Uh, again, just, you know, working with different departments, um, continuing to build relationships, uh, and and just building up that skill set and and that my repertoire of um, you know how I interact with people and and how I try to build those relationships to make sure that I understand you know what people's backgrounds are where do they want to go uh, even if they weren't direct reports to me I still am interested in that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you moved on from there to your current position. And I've always admired the fact that you kind of have this very clear uh, career path kind of laid out. It's every year or two, I expect to either move up a different position, different responsibilities, different pay grades, whatever it might be. And you've always been very clear about that. So then bring us up to speed that where you are now and what that entails. Yeah. So now I have a, a team of 150 folks uh, under normal circumstances. That's what my organization looks like. Of course, with uh, with everything that's going on now, that's uh, slightly been adjusted, but uh, still looking to build it back up to its its former glory. Um, and again, it's uh, providing experiences for people. So it's not just um, helping growth within my organization. It's also really focused around providing experiences for um, a large tech, tech company in the, in the, end, in the area, uh, making sure that their employees, their guests, um, their vendors, anyone else that's going to be in that environment is having the best possible experience and that we're really going above and beyond um, and exploring what, what types of um, ways that we can actually improve that experience are. Excellent. Excellent. And I think, yeah, and I, I think it's talking to you recently about this too, that you're, you kind of, as I just mentioned, you got your sights set on yet what's to come in the next year or so. So I think it's exciting too. And just a quick sidebar too, speaking of uh, sites set on things, uh, I know you do real estate on the side too, which is also a nice thing. I've always felt very strongly about having a vocation and an avocation. And that avocation has been a pretty good little thing for you, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, uh I would say it's been beneficial to have available to me to, again, I, I continue to draw it back to, you know, relationships and, and how I can help others accomplish what they're trying to do. Um, because buying a first house is a huge step, right? It's, it's something that um, not a lot of people necessarily would think about as, oh, you know, how are you going to do that? That's, that's such a, that's a major thing. Um, so being a part of first-time home buyers in particular, um, 
and helping that, them down that journey and helping them understand what some of the challenges are that they might face and just bringing it to reality for them. Um, because, you know, buying a house or having a living situation is a universal thing, but the way that you approach it is going to be different depending on your personality, depending on your background and depending on, um, you know, the, the type of work that you do, you know, what your knowledge is of the industry, what your knowledge is of, uh, you know, competition in the market, things like that. It, it, I find it to be really beneficial to have somebody that can translate, you know, into like terms for, for someone who might not be as much of an expert um, and just, you know, put it into terms that are, they're comfortable with. I, I think that's been one of the biggest parts uh, of the, you know, real estate piece that I've really gone, gotten a lot of um, satisfaction out of is, again, just being able to translate things into, into terms that people understand and, and feel comfortable with so that it turns what otherwise is a very daunting experience into something that's a little bit more um, comfortable, exciting, fun. You know, that's, that, that's the way I look at it. Well, and I think too, uh, I want to go back just to see if there's anything else you wanted to add terms in terms of tips or advice or comments for people, because you think about whether it was the real estate, whether it was at the bank, at zones and now in your current at the high tech company, uh, managing people, relationships with people you've mentioned several times. And I, I noticed that I meant, made this mention earlier, go on vacations, don't put things off, um, uh, really appreciate things. And you said it's okay when they had the, the pain of loss, take the time, it's okay to feel lost. Today is not a great day, it's gonna be okay. Don't dig a hole. Any other thoughts you'd give to the younger generation saying, Kyle, you've got this experience, have you got 20 years on me or whatever it might be that you might say to somebody who's just starting out in the work world? Yeah, I, I mean, there's definitely a few things that I, you know, I could I could hark back on that I think have been beneficial for me or that I feel like I could have done better. Um, I'd say one thing that is really important is being constantly curious about your environment. And, you know, whether that be the online environment or whether that be the physical environment, you know, the people around you, um, just always asking questions about why is this that way? Um, how can I get myself involved in that? Who can I have a conversation with today that might, you know, open doors or open up my understanding of something different? You know, you never know when you're going to be sitting next to somebody on the bus and strike up a conversation with them and it could turn into, um, you know, a long-term relationship or it could turn into a job opportunity. Um, so just never closing yourself off, I think, is one of the biggest things that I would really draw on from my experience. Um, because there, there's definitely been times in my life where I felt like, you know, I'm comfortable with the friend group that I have. I'm comfortable with the family that I have. I don't really feel like I need to expand my network. Um, I'm feeling good about it, right? And then you just shut yourself off from all of these great opportunities. And when you, when you do have those conversations, and it's so eye-opening that, wow, I never would have learned this person's story if I hadn't just said hi to them, right? So that's, that's a big piece of it. Um, let's see, I think um, yeah. one of the big pieces is definitely learning about the financial industry and how that could potentially impact your life over time. Um, I think that my time at the bank, as much as it was great to build relationships there, it was also just equally as important that I was uh, gaining some financial understanding and seeing what some of the shortfalls were. Uh, you know, I would see people that were constantly overdrawn. They, they had a good check coming in. They were making a good amount of money, but they were spending well beyond what that money was coming in. So, you know, recognizing that you don't always need to go out and buy the new phone or, or buy the new coat. And it, it's a little bit better to, um, you know, recognize what your means are and, and be responsible about that and, and not overextend yourself, um, you're going to be able to survive without that phone, right? But if you set yourself down a path where you're constantly behind and trying to play catch up and, and working through, you know, credit and, and that sort of thing, you, you could really, really put yourself in a bad spot. Yeah, that's, I really like that too. And uh, constantly curious about your environment, never closing yourself off, always expand your network, learning about the financial industry. So, so very important. So, well, we've just got a few minutes left and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, have you just tell the listeners and viewers a little bit about 
a little less than two years ago, you became a father to my granddaughter, Olivia, and of course had gotten married a couple of years before that. Talk a little bit about that experience for the viewers. <laughs> it, it's totally different than anything that I've experienced. Uh, <laughs> You know, you feel like you have everything together and you figured the world out. And then uh, all of a sudden there's this little, you know, eight pound ball of <laughs> organic material that is suddenly challenging every uh, every norm that you've ever thought that you come across and, and every understanding that you thought you had of the world um, and doing so on very lim limited sleep. So uh, it, it's been... Uh, it's been a great experience, honestly. Um, there's been a lot of learning that we've done along the way, and I'm I'm very happy to say I have an extremely supportive wife who, um, you know, really takes the ball and runs with it. She's extremely supportive for me. I I hope that I'm as equally supportive to her. Uh, but we really approach parenting as a partnership and and being on the same page and understanding. Um, you know, the way that we want to approach things and not feeling like we're in conflict with one another and the way that we're approaching different situations. Uh, I think that makes a huge difference in what we've experienced up to this point, because we are quickly approaching the terrible twos and it's already started to show itself. I, I, I've heard the N-O word a few times uh, and from, from a one and a half year old, that's a little bit scary, <laughs> but um, it is something that we were working through and, and just making sure that just like we support each other, that Olivia also feels um, extremely supported when she does something, you know, positive and, and recognizing her accomplishments and just being encouraging along the way. Um, that's really been something that I found a lot of, uh, I found a lot of value in and I've been really happy to share with family and, and friends and it's been very, very rewarding. Excellent. And I might add, you mentioned Olivia is your daughter and Susanna is your wife and that is an absolutely lovely lady. So, well, we are coming to a close and I always ask my guests the same last question and I've gotten so many different answers on this. It's always fun to see what people say, but, uh, and that is you get to pick one thing and what's the one thing, you know, today that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you. I'm sure a popular answer is probably the winning lotto numbers. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it is just, you know, I think the biggest thing that I could, I could point to from that would be doing things that, you know, you want to do for yourself rather than doing them because you feel like this is what somebody else wants you to do. Um, you're going to get so much farther and so much more benefit out of the activities that you do, uh, if you're doing it because you know that it's taking you down a path that you care about, rather than, uh, you know, my dad wants to, me to be a lawyer, or my mom really wants me to be a dentist. Um, what do I want to do? And and how am I going to accomplish that? It, it not only fuels passion for you, but it also improves your own integrity, because you're not doing it just because somebody else is looking at you do it. You're doing it because you know that it's what you want to do. And I think that fuels, you know, success throughout your entire life. If you're always doing something and always setting goals around things that you care about rather than what you think you should be doing. Yeah, I totally agree. And you said earlier about using it's been used a lot, but I don't care. You can never be uh, said too often about put the air mask on you first. That relationship you have with yourself is so important. And uh, I heard something that was actually on the podcast. I listened to a lot of other podcasts. And the person, the guest said something about, you want to be your own best friend. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of a neat thing to have myself. I'm my own best friend because <laughs> I can always count on myself. So, well, thank you so much, Kyle. And let me remind all the listeners again, as we wrap up here, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I do appreciate that. And as I close, I always like to remind people, I know that a lot of people struggle with a lot of life issues, and I do have a program for individuals in that type of situation. It's my gratitude coaching program, which gives you a coach that can fully believe in you and can propel you forward to achieve anything your mind can conceive. The support you receive is unmatched in getting you to believe in you and make changes that you've been wanting and needing to make. Whether it's your finances, your relationships, your career, your life's journey that you want to change, and this is a great program for you. Gaining a complete understanding of your challenges, asking powerful questions, providing guidance, and a very high level of accountability, along with an attitude of gratitude, of course, 
all combined to ensure your personal success. My six-month proprietary gratitude coaching program is available to my podcast listeners with an additional two months free if you hear about it on the radio. And if you can get me, as I mentioned earlier, at thatgratitudeguy.com or email david at thatgratitudeguy.com. And one last uh, comment is that a lot of people like my Monday morning minute. I send out a 60-second inspirational gratitude video every Monday morning at 6.15 a.m. If you'd like to get it, go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in gratitude guy, all one word, and it'll send you an email that you can, or a link rather, you can sign up with your email. So thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate all you listeners and viewers. And as I always say to wrap up every podcast, remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.